welcome to everybody to another uh, discussion today on RAM, Renew the African Mindset. Um, RAM is actually a platform for discussing topical issues which affects the um, African diaspora. However, we seem to realize that it's not only the African diaspora, it's Africans, and hence the reason Renew the African Mindset. Um, it's also a platform whereby we create awareness on topical issues which we hardly talk about in the open, just like the subject matter we have today, female genital mutilation. And within the African communities, there is always this culture of silence. Hence the reason why some people just die in silence and they do not seek the prompt um, uh, help that they need. So uh, today, we are going to talk about a very, very sensitive topic, female genital mutilation. Some people will say to you, what's female genital mutilation? It's something that's been practiced for, you know, centuries. Now, all of a sudden, people are saying that we should eradicate it. Well, we will listen to some people who have actually been through it, how harrowing of an experience it is. And people might say that, well, Female genital mutilation is not the same thing as a male circumcision. We will listen to the experts as they speak on the differences between male circumcision and female genital mutilation. Some people call it female genital cutting. We will know the difference from the people here today. To have some sort of robust discussion, we're going to look at it from uh, the cultural point of view up to a certain degree, the, uh, the legal angle to it, uh, the medical as well. And then what's the psychological effect of having female genital mutilation? Some people will say to you that, um, well, with uh, female genital mutilation, people have the reversal. It's nothing but uh, a myth. We're going to listen to it today because what's your mindset? Your mindset is actually based on uh, cultural beliefs, traditional values, your religion, your family background, your exposure and the associations you've had throughout uh, you know, your upbringing. So today, uh, without further ado, we go straight into uh, the discussion. I was actually looking at the uh, website of World Health Organization and it says the uh, FGM practice has no health benefits for girls and women. We'll hear from the midwife here today to tell us that. Uh, more than 200 million girls and women alive today have been cut in 30 countries in Africa, Middle East, and Asia. FGM is said to be a violation of human rights of women and girls. The legal representative here today is going to tell us that. And WHO is opposed to all forms of FGM and opposed to healthcare providers performing FGM. Now, when we talk about the treatment, the treatment of health complications of FGM in 27 high prevalence countries cost $1.4 billion per year. So, ladies and gentlemen, our first guest today is actually FGM consultant, public health specialist. She's had 35 years experience of working with the NHS in England. She's a researcher of women's health and a very strong campaigner against FGM, women and children's rights. She's the founder of Global Comfort Charity. Welcome, Dr. Comfort Momo, MBA. Dr. Comfort, tell us briefly, what does FGM mean, female genital mutilation? Thank you so much, Anne, for putting this together. Um, female genital mutilation, like you've rightly said, is a grave violation of human rights for both girls and women. Um, there are four different types of female genital mutilation. Maybe before I go there, we can say female genital mutilation comprises all procedures that involves the partial or total removal of genital, um, the genitalia, which we have four different types. Like I said, type one is the removal of the clitoris, either totally or partially. And then we have the type two, where the clitoris is removed, again, either totally or partially, and the um, inner leaves, which is the labia minora. And then we have a type three, where everything's been removed, i.e. the clitoris, either totally or partially, 
as well as the labor menorah, in some cases, the labor majora, everything removed and stitched together, leaving a tiny opening for the passage of menstrual flow or urine. And then we have a fourth one, which is unclassified, includes pricking, piercing, or introduction of corrosive material to the vulva area. So those are the uh, four various forms of female genital mutilation. Yes. So would you say there's a difference? Because in the US is known as female genital cutting. Over in the UK is female genital mutilation. What's the difference? Well, there's no difference. Um, the thing is, I normally go by WHO's um, terminology. I prefer to call it female genital genital mutilation. Like you rightly said, some will call it female genital mutilation slash cutting. Mm -hmm. But for me as a professional, for me as a midwife caring for women and girls who've been through FGM, I prefer to call it female genital mutilation to show the extent of damage to the vulva area. But like you've rightly said, other people see it differently. Okay. Now, as a midwife, did you treat women who had undergone uh, FGM any different from uh, somebody who, you know, who hadn't? Um, what, what were you trying, what are you trying to say is like the difference between a woman who's been through FGM mm -hmm. and somebody who hasn't. Yes. Obviously, if you've been through FGM, like I've told you the different types, mm -hmm. when you been through FGM, there are lots of complications that can arise, mm -hmm. i.e. infection, mm -hmm. um, tetanus can arise, there can be a problem during childbirth, mm -hmm. you can have problem with your menstrual flow, you can have recurrent urinary tract infection. So again, you need to look at um, the consequences, the complications. So definitely there is a difference mm -hmm. between a um, a woman who's been through FGM and non-FGM woman, definitely. Okay. So, uh, for example, instead of having natural uh, birth delivery, you probably su suggest cesarean then, if you see the extent of the damage? Not necessarily. In the past, many, many years ago, when FGM was new, especially here in this country, women were having unnecessary cesarean section. Yeah. Um, but once we know that if you have a type 3, we can do de infibulation or reversal, then we can correct that and women can have normal birth. So cesarean and um, female genital mutilation is not a reason for cesarean section. All right. So when you talk about the uh, constructive or reconstructive surgery, as it were, would they not say that that's a bit cosmetic? Well, there are lots of arguments around that. If for me, as a midwife or as somebody who walked around FGM for many, many years, mm -hmm. you have to perform de infibulation for a type three, especially when they're getting married. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a small opening right. there's no way you can have a proper penetration during sexual intercourse mm -hmm. as well as during childbirth so you need to sensitively support women during childbirth and you need to perform the infibulation definitely all right thank you uh, dr comfort at, at this point in time can i just say to you if you have any questions just post them in the uh chat box so that okay. during uh, question and answer period, we pick up all the questions there or if you have any comments. I'll still come back to you, Dr. Comfort. The next person I have on board here is um, a medical doctor and head technician for New York Medical Center based in Lagos, Nigeria. She's a family physician with over three decades of experience in pediatrics, family practice, female reproductive and several health um, it, um, several health. She's also an uh, experienced GP trainer, appraisal and safeguarding lead of a large practice in, in Essex in England. Welcome, Dr. Toyin Adenaike. Could you tell me, you've lived in the UK, you've practiced in the United Kingdom and now in Nigeria. Um, how would you identify someone who has actually undergone uh, female genital mutilation? Thank you. Thank you for putting this together and thank you for having me. Um, I have practiced in the UK, and as you rightly mentioned, I was a safeguarding lead, both for children and adults. Unfortunately, I worked at a time when the UK 
was I think was really putting FGM on top of the agenda mm -hmm. because for a long time it was a hidden topic. It was something we whispered on the corridor between the GP and the midwife to say, how do we help this person? How do we support them? But I'm really glad to see, I'm proud to say that both in the United Kingdom and in Nigeria, the profile of FGM has been raised. So in the UK now, it has become illegal. And I hope everybody now knows that. Not only that there is robust, not only legislation, safeguarding mm -hmm. documents and things to identify and give holistic care to these children and women. Right. Fortunately or unfortunately in Nigeria, we have not come that far. <laughs> Whilst as a government, Nigeria signs up to all the Human Rights Act, the Child Children's Act, all the UNESCO Convention and so on. The problem we have is still that there is no backup. So in the UK, you have the backup of the various safeguarding lead of the police, of the government. There are CAF forms when you identify women, as Dr. Comfort just said, from the midwife point of view, right from when they're booking these ladies. It is a question that they sensitively ask when they identify a woman who may have been cut. In Nigeria, it is still a topic in the dark. Okay. Uh, I am aware that there are lots of NGOs that are working very, very hard to bring it to the forefront, to educate people, but we don't have all those frameworks that I mentioned that are in the UK. So my practice, obviously because I have been sensitized in the UK and had the learning and the skills and the knowledge, I actively seek this women out. But it's not as easy to do as it is in the UK. Okay, thank you very much for that. So what do you do when you realize that a patient has undergone FGM? So usually I would find out either because they have come for antenatal care. Sometimes, in fact, the first lady I had, I encouraged her to have a pap smear. A pap smear is when we take samples from the neck of the womb to detect changes that predate cancer. So yeah. cervical cancer is one of the cancers that are preventable. A lady need not get cancer if they're having their pap smear regularly. So I encouraged her to come and have one, and she did only for me to find out that I actually could not do a pap smear because she had had the type 4 F FGM. So we needed to sit down and sensitively discuss it because she was not aware uh, that she couldn't have the pap smear because of what had happened. Uh, and then we had to have further discussion as to whether she wanted a reversal or not, the process, the procedure. And don't forget, a lot of healthcare in Nigeria is paid out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So when you're practicing in a country like that, you also have to be aware that there is no NHS that picks up the tabs. So, a lot, so your, the thinking is quite different and the approach and how we handle those sensitive issues is quite different. But I'm also proud to say that there aren't as many as I would have expected. I think the message is slowly filtering through, but what we need is the right support. Okay, but thank you. Um, would you say then, moving on from there, is your approach to dealing with patients in Nigeria different from those in the UK? You highlighted a bit of it, but then, of course, there's also the element of culture. What were the cultural challenges faced, uh, you know, with your patients in Nigeria? Uh, one of the challenges is what some people still assume is normal. So, especially people in their middle age to 60s and 70s. Right. They don't, it was normalized for them. Right. So trying to encourage them and tell them that the fact that you have been caught does not mean your granddaughter has mm -hmm. to be caught. Because some of us in the UK send our kids back home to Nigeria for secondary school or for whatever reasons. So mm -hmm. you, know, I, you now have the challenge of trying to raise the awareness of these women mm -hmm. because FGM is actually mostly done by the matriarchs in the society. Right. So to have the challenge of educating them, raising their awareness, discussing with them, engaging them to understand that it is an unnecessary procedure. It is not medical. It has no benefit to it whatsoever. So you start from there. Mm -hmm. And then for the younger women, it's the same. You have to really sensitively approach it because sometimes they don't even want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is discussed openly. Right. Fortunately, we as a healthcare professional, 
we always say that no subject is taboo. And I constantly say that so right. that my nurses and my other young doctors are aware that when they're within the four walls of our consulting room, their confidentiality is maintained um, like it would anywhere else in the world. So by encouraging, by building trust, Right. And encouraging them to talk about all of these issues, we sometimes are able to engage those women. But the challenge really is getting them to even want to discuss it in the first place. Right. So it, it, it's so strange you should mention that because to tell a grandma who's been through it, even her own generations, past generations have been through it, and then you want to change that type of mindset that is so entrenched in the cultural belief. So I think it's just a matter of educating them all the time and gaining their trust, as you've said. Well, now we're going to uh, hear from some of these uh, FGM survivors. They're going to share their personal experiences with us. And maybe it would um, reinforce it in our minds that really and truly, we do not have to encourage FGM anymore, especially for those of us who are educated, for those of us who have um, you know, broaden our mindsets regarding this, that there is no, because some people will say to you that, um, that, that there is a religious angle to it, that they've been doing this for centuries and there's nothing wrong, you know, so we need to hear from these people. So the first person I will call on is Mama Sila. She's actually from Guinea. Uh, she's anti-FGM campaigner for the Guinean community in the United Kingdom. She organizes workshops and collaborates with other FGM agencies. Welcome, Mama Sila. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Hello, so, everyone. Could you just briefly tell us when you had the FGM done and just share, you know, a few minutes of that with us? Oh, well, I, I had FGM when I was around nine to 10 years old. So obviously, um, as you know, Guinea is uh, one of the highest countries that with high prevalence. Mm -hmm. So it's like nine out of 10 girls are caught. So um, I've been, when I was growing up, I, I always thought it was normal until like a few years ago, till 2015. So about, that's what happened. I was caught when I was around nine to 10 years old. So you said um, you didn't feel any different until 2015. I mean, you don't no, need to no, tell I, me your I did. No, 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 no. I did feel it because I knew I was caught because I had some health issues like um, infections, but I didn't know nothing like about the type of FGM till about 2015. And I'm, I was born in 1980. So obviously right. throughout all these years, I didn't know nothing about it. Right. So, um, did you, so when you now found out, um, how did you feel about it? Who actually made you go through it? Your grandma or your no, mother? No, my mom. Obviously, you know, she went through it. Her sisters went through it. My grandma as well went through it. Yes. And uh, my mom and dad, I have like, we are 11, you know. Yes. We got 10 boys and myself, so I'm only the only girl. So it was like a privilege for her to take me to be caught. Right. So that's what happened. And I knew about it like... Um, in 2015, I was pregnant with my boy and I went to the hospital for this, you know, routine check. So obviously I was attending all my appointments. Then one of them, I missed it. They said I should go and see a midwife. Wow. I didn't go. Then they sent me a letter. So obviously I went. So when I went, they were, they asked me like, uh, if I was from Guinea, I said, yes. If I have had FTM, I said, yes. Then they asked me what type I had. I said, no, I didn't even know. It's my first time to hear about type of FTM. Mm -hmm. So that was at uh, Whittington with Clark, Joe Clark. She was the, I think, the FTM coordinator at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said to me, well, do you mind us checking? And I said, no. So they checked me. So when she finished, she said, well, the reason we're asking you all these questions, I know we're expecting a baby. We didn't know yet if you're having a boy or a girl. However, I just let you know. In the UK, it's illegal. Even if you have the baby, you go on holiday, for instance, and then your mom and dad, they caught the girl, sorry. They caught the girl, there will be an issue. So you'll be sent to jail. I said, all right. So when I left, I did the kind of survey with my own community in here in the UK because we had a big Guinean community. So I was like asking everyone, the ladies, like, what type of FGM do you have? And nine out of 10 didn't know they have type, this type of FTM. So this is what pushed me to do 
to raise the awareness and run workshops. Right. Thank you for that. But could you yeah. tell me, did you ever ask your mother why you went through FGM? Never, never. I didn't. Oh, I never really asked her. <laughs> no. It's just after I had those experiences, then I was talking about it. I did speak to her. Then I found out, obviously, she didn't know Ada because she went through it and uh, she thought it was normal. Yes. Yeah. But I did, when I explained to her about the consequences, she said, oh, well, if I knew, I wouldn't do it to you. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. One other question that I have for you is that, um, well, since you found out, did you feel some sort of resentment against your mom? or you just took it as normal anyway? No, I didn't find any resentment because the reason why, because my, my mom never been to school. So obviously she don't know any health implication. All she knew that she'd gone through it is like normal. So it's this kind of cycle. Her, siblings, her sisters, they all went through FGM. So I didn't have any resentment toward it. But when I explained to her about health implication and what I went through, because I had so many infections when I got here. It been, I've been like going to my GP. I, got, I came into the UK in 2012, so I went to my GP from 2012 till 2014. I'm going to the GP and they keep sending me. I've used all type of pessaries. They never said, oh, it's FTM. When I had my twin girls two years ago, then I went for the six month check right. because now it's a compulsory, so all GPs have to do like a kind of list of FGM survivors they have seen in their GP. Right. Then my GP went, oh, mama, you know what? I need to ask you something because I was with my husband. So mm -hmm. she was kind of reluctant. She said, oh, the last time I saw you, but I didn't want to ask you. Is it? I said, yeah. I said, how have I done? She said, well, you know, you've been coming here for all these years. I've gone through your record. I was just thinking, have you been caught? I said, yeah. She said, oh, I see now why you had so many infections. I said, yeah, you know what? I'm going to sue you. So we just laughed. I said, how come you didn't pick up? She said, oh, she didn't know then. So now she can see the reason I have the infection is linked to my FGM. Mm -hmm. Then she said to me, you know, um, because on their computer, it says girl at three. She said, well, I know you will. I'm just saying, you know, you have girls, so don't cut them. I said, no, don't worry it's not going to happen. So I know, so it's not going to happen. All right, then. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Okay. Um, at the next person we have is Hawa. I'm not sure whether Hawa is actually here with us. Hawa Sese. Okay. I would actually go to the next person we have. Um, and this is Alima Tu. Alima Tu is from Syria alone. She's an international keynote speaker for women and girls' rights agenda. She's the founder of A Girl at a Time, an award-winning women and girls' rights advocate. Obviously, a very, very strong advocate of, uh, well, anti-FGM campaigner. Welcome, Alima Tu. Alimatu. Uh, okay. Right. Can you hear me? Fine. Can you hear you now. Welcome, Alimatu. Oh, great. Yes. Thank you. Can you please uh, share yours with us. When did you have your FGM? And well, how was your feeling afterwards when you found out? Well, mine are like um, um, Mama Silla. And thank you so much, by the way. Thank you for this program. And I'm truly honored to be among great women and women that have actually paved the way for women like ourselves. So I want to commend and just say thank you to their hard work and making it easy for us to talk about our experiences of FGM. Mm -hmm. So in my case, mine was quite like uh, most people brutal. I'm from Sierra Leone, the type of FGM we practice there. In fact, we do two, you're cut twice. You're cut when you're maybe six to 10, and then you're cut when you're adolescent. In my case, my parents hated FGM. They did all they could to protect myself and my sisters because um, obviously now I know better because I've spoken with my mother and she's told me about her experiences. Mm. So she did everything she could. Sadly, uh, my grandmother, who like you said, the matriarch of the family, she was the boss of the family. She gave me my name. She would tell us what food we eat for the day thought, well, you're not going to thrive in Sierra Leone 
and be the kind of woman you want to be if you are not cut. And this is the, the level at which FGM is in Sierra Leone. Mm. If you are not cut, you're not part of that society. You're not part of your community. And even when you don't want to be cut, because the amount of times people talk about what they've gained from the society, it's called the Bondo Society, it re usually brings women together and it gives them this um, sense of belonging. Mm. Obviously, what they never tell you is that you will be cut as part of joining the Bondo Society. Mm -hmm. So when I was 16, I'd done my exams in Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and I was coming to the UK. So my grandmother felt, well, if she ever goes to the UK, that will be it because she'll be there like 20 or 16, 20 years old and it'd be too late and who would marry her and who would, you know, so coming from a family where in my case, both my grandparents, my grandmothers were matriarch in the Bondo society itself. So they, they either were sort of, I don't know how to put it. If they don't cut their grandkids, the other women will say, well, how dare you? You're making us cut our girls because you're in charge of the society. Yet you so my grandmother in so many ways, now I know better um, because she died two years after I came to the UK, was that they were also under pressure. So, but in my case, I was fortunate when I came to the UK, though I know how hard and terrible my experience of FGM was horrific. I cannot put any other ways of describing it, but saying it was really bad. Mm. But um, I thank God, because either I would have lost the will to fight uh, in terms of knowing what was happening, because I had no idea what it was. Mm. In my case, I couldn't make any connection with my FGM and to my well-being, my health and how I was feeling. Mm. I couldn't express myself because in my case, I felt everybody was the same. In fact, at one point, I was becoming really radical about it, saying, well, what do you want me to do? It's happened. And I, I felt as much as I was angry and upset about it, there was nothing I could do. And so I got married, had my first baby, and was encouraged then by my um, husband to seek help because he was getting to a point where it was over sort of taking my life at every moment of my time. I would feel so low, I would feel so angry, but yet I couldn't do anything about it. And I was just thinking, this is unfair. Why can this happen? Why should this be happening? But I could not speak about it because one of the things you're told in Sierra Leone, you cannot talk about this. It's forbidden. You have made an oath in the Bondo society that you must never um, speak about this. So I was sort of cut between that emotion, cut between the reality, cut between my tradition, cut between my customs, and everything that has been sort of told in the past, I could not make sense of it. So um, I obviously was pregnant now, and I went to a place in where I used to live, and thankfully I met Comfort. So Comfort was my midwife at the time, and I gave her a lot of grief, by the way, uh, because again, I just felt, don't even say it. I already know how bad I feel. I already know this is horrible. Do you know, there's nothing I can do. I can't go and tell my family that this is a horrible experience I'm going through. But she always kept reassuring me that it, oh, it will be okay. You just need to take care of your health, take care of your well-being. You're gonna have a baby. And you know, you need to sort of take control of that aspect of your life because he was dominating my life was taking over me gradually every day i was upset i go to the clinic and i saw all the other pregnant women were happy but i wasn't it's like why do you know because of what had happened to me because i was so scared i said i'm gonna have to push this baby out in my pain that i'm already going through so thankfully i deliver the baby and i deliver safely but i went through a lot of complications as a result of my fgm no. Oh, wow. Yes. So it made me became this kind of a person that I needed help, but I don't know where to go for the help because there wasn't that many places. Now we see doctors, midwives, everybody's been trained about it. Mm -hmm. but, um, it was two amazing people, Layla, you've got Layla here and Nimku. So I sat here and I watched a brilliant program and I felt this is me because all the other programs that talked about FGM in the UK back then, Hmm. where images of uh, women, mostly Africa, in a hut somewhere, 
dirty, filthy, you know, it, it was just too much. And for me, I just said, no, this is not the kind of FGMI experience. Mm -hmm. It was done in a way where there was love shown, there was appreciation shown. As much as it was so painful and so horrific, this needs to be told. This story needs to be told because I come from a country where the women hold on to this tradition that is so, we know it's violent, but they just hold on to it. What if I asked you the question, uh, Alimad, yeah. that uh, the reason why, put it this way, uh, for the benefit of everybody listening to me here, I'll be playing the devil's advocate here because <laughs> there's some people, they are pro-FGM. And yes. um, I don't want to bring them on board, but I'll represent them in some instances. So this is one of them. And I say to you, look, this is what I did. I went through it. Your grandma went through it. Your great-grandma went through it. And the reason why it was done for you was to prevent you from being promiscuous. Would you accept that? Well, the, the excuses they give us so vary. They would tell you, oh, they cut you because they don't want you to be promiscuous. But what they fail to realize, many times in, the, in my case and experiences that I've had, mm -hmm. and from Sierra Leone, a lot of the women that are even formed for what I would call loose mm -hmm. or engage in active sexual um, life are women that have not been cut, are women that have been cut, sorry, are women ha that have been cut. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't sort of, for me, it doesn't sit well because in the very country where we're trying to say, because I'm cut, I, 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 you know, I'm a better woman, we also have women who are not cut and I couldn't see the difference. They're just like us. You know, so we shouldn't use this tradition to, 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 but then it's driven by patriarchy, it's driven by misogyny. It's a country steeped in mysticism, steeped in uh, where women are treated as second class citizen. Mm -hmm. So obviously, yes, the only opportunity that women see themselves as becoming somewhat, uh, in terms of their status, somewhat, you know, belonging, mm -hmm. is when they feel they've got married and when they feel the society is supporting them. Okay. So anything that goes contrary to that, mm. you get a, a friction. And so which is why we have come in as Sierra Leoneans in my case, because again, it was an area where people don't understand the dynamics of the FGM debate in Sierra Leone. Okay. It's highly politicized and highly controlled. Mm -hmm. So we needed to break away and I was prepared to do that instead of, um, just staying quiet. And that's what got me into the work that I do now. Okay. So there seems to be a society or class in Sierra Leone known as Bondu. Could you tell me a bit about it? Well, this is FGM. So the Bondu Society, it's, it's an institution, just like with education, just like with marriage. Um, it was an institution. In fact, most people don't know this. And this is why I always like to educate the Sierra Leonean. What we now know, the lady who brought about bringing girls together so they can be cut or training women to be married off to chiefs or royal um, sort of extended family, mm -hmm. she came to the UK. She came to, to rally for independence of Sierra Leone and met Queen Victoria. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was a debutante going on. And we all know what the debutante does in the UK, where they get girls from um, royal families or what we then know as aristocrat of us i don't even know class because the class uk and Sierra Leone has a lot in common by the way mm -hmm. it's a former british colony but a lot of our historical context around women and women's right stems from that fact so this lady madame yoko saw that women were being groomed for men so she also had a similar setup in Sierra Leone, but she didn't have it as it were in the UK. So she took that to Sierra Leone and thought, okay, this is something we could do. We can get women into a house or an enclosure. We will groom them, we will buy clothing, teach them how to do their makeup, how to cook, how to even have sex with their men. And But in doing that, we also have to cut them because we don't want loose women because what we now know in the 1800s, mm -hmm. uh, women with high hysteria or high sex drive mm -hmm. would have type 1 FGM, which is what we do in Sierra Leone. We do the clitoridectomy and we do the excision because it was stemmed from that. And it's similar. Everything about the debutante, it's the same as in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. The women, the girls are taken away for about two to four weeks 
clothing, the family come with, you know, nice things, jewelry. So there's the enticement there for a lot of girls. They want to have those jewelry. They want to have those woven material. They want to have all the good things, pots and pans. Mm -hmm. So we'll always say, oh yeah, I want to go. But most times they go in there. If they were happy kids, as I, as I was, I was very happy. I was outgoing. I love color. The minute I was cut, my whole entire life changed. Mm -hmm. I became this closed person. I didn't have the character that I had before. I was just shy. I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't speak Can to my parents. One last question here. Why do you think it is difficult for the Sierra Leonean government to make uh, the practice of FGM illegal? Well, it's, it's because many of the women who run these, what I call societies, mm -hmm. are highly influential, highly placed. These women can rally and bring other women to vote. Right. So can you hear me? My yes. internet is playing now. Mm -hmm. So obviously, these women carry enormous power in their communities. And I always tell people this, if you're not cut, you cannot have a marriage ceremony. Mm -hmm. You cannot have even like a table in the market. You couldn't eat from the same plate as some of your family members because they see you as unclean. So imagine in a community where the, what we call the mummy queens or the soways are in charge. If you don't subscribe to the institution of that bond of society, you feel left out, which is why we have a small community called the Creoles, who for, for decades and centuries now, in fact, mm -hmm. have been marginalized. The women want to be part of the, the wider Sierra Leonean community, but they're marginalized. Why? And I solely think, I may be wrong and I stand corrected. And that's because a lot of the Creole women are not in the Bondo society, because this Bondo society pander to the political dynamics. Mm -hmm. They choose the, the, the chief, they choose the ministers, whoever is going to run for, for office comes from within that fraternity of gatherings of people. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. And so politicians will not say a word because they dare not offend these very people that are going to bring the votes for them. They don't care if they don't build a school. They don't care if they don't build a hospital in your community. For them, all they do is when it's time for election, they buy bags of rice, oil, and they give these women that do the cutting lots of money, lots and lots of money. And says, oh, could you cut us a hundred girls? Because those mothers of those hundred girls, potential voters, their fathers will be potential voters, and anybody else that they know will go and vote for them because they feel, well, we can always go to this individual to help us. Mm -hmm. So it's almost holding a knife at a lot of women's necks because these politicians will never say a word Hmm. It makes them feel good that this is happening. And they always say it's the women that need to talk about this. And there are women who are pro because they have a political aspiration. A lot of the women you see from Sierra Leone pushing for FGM to continue, hmm. these women at some point will become ministers. So that's why they are supporting. The, in, in fact, sometimes it's poor girls who are people from poorer communities mm -hmm. because now people with much money are very powerful in their, in their voices mm -hmm. and will talk and they will say, I don't want my daughter to be cut. Mm -hmm. But if you're from a village or the province where you don't have much say, that every decision you make is made by the chief or the local mommy queen, mm -hmm. your daughter will be cut. Wow. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure you probably need uh, the likes of... Uh, Need them to actually come into Sierra Leone to sort them out. And well, <laughs> the more campaigners you have in Sierra Leone, the better it is in order to get um, the FGM illegal. You know. Yes, well, this debates, these sort of debates have been helping. So we're now seeing change. Right. In my time, it was almost like 95 women were cut, 95% of women were cut. But in the last few years, that number has gone down to like 85, 86. And obviously the average age has also sort of gone up a little bit, which is like 14, 15. In the past, it was maybe six, seven years old. Right. So some change is happening, but we still need, we need the collective of the African continent right. to drive this change that we want to see in Sierra Leone and in Nigeria. Yes, of Thank course. You. Thank you so much, Alimatu. Thank you <laughs> for... Uh, enlightening us about what's going on in uh, Sierra Leone. And thanks for sharing with us uh, yourself and Sila.
uh, Mama Sila. The next person we have here is Oshu State Coordinator of Inter-African Committee in Nigeria. Uh, she focuses on the eradication of harmful traditional practices affecting women and children. She's a social worker and a consultant and community mobilizer in ma with many years of experience working with the Ministry of Women Affairs in Oshu State. Welcome, Mrs. Obelawo. Can you hear me now, Mrs. Obelawo? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay, fine. Now, you are focusing on the traditional practices. I'm sure you would realize that in Oshu State, there's so many, you know, we are so entrenched, especially the Yoruba tribe, in so many things, the culture, which we always say that is a very rich culture. So if somebody were to say to you that, look, this is the way we've been doing things. You are an indigene of Oshu State. Why are you pushing this? This is something traditional. Where do you stand in this? Thank you so very much. That question is uh, the kind of question we normally come across whenever we are on sensitization or mm -hmm. we are on a radio or television program. Yes, female genital mutilation is a cultural, you know, practice. We construed in a situation of ignorance. You know, it became a social norm because someone just sat down somewhere and felt that uh, this thing should be Excise and then it becomes a norm. And without questioning why this should be part of our tradition, people just follow like that and it became something that is passed down from generation to generation without anyone, you know, being bold enough to ask questions. So the culture of silence helped in making it to become part of our culture. Like you said, we have rich culture. And then, all, I mean, this part of our culture that are rich, that are good, that are positive, we are to continue to promote them and then protect them. But culture like female genital mutilation is harmful. Right from time, I mean, time immemorial, it has been harmful. But people don't know because there's no information. They don't have relevant information. They, don't, they didn't know. And what you know, you know. What you don't know, you don't know. But now, the scenario is changing. Thanks to the development partners that came, you know, to galvanize support and we were awakening, I mean, you know, stimulating us into action. And that's why everywhere today, you, you, you go about, you know, campaigning against female genital mutilation. Mention will always be made about, I mean, of uh, the UNFPA UNICEF joint program on female genital abandonment, uh, female genital mutilation abandonment. You know, series of activities were done. Like you said, I've been involved in this uh, campaign for many years, working in the Ministry of Women Affairs, and then becoming a consultant to the UNFPA, I have the opportunity to go to the hinterland, you know, to, to mobilize people against the practice. And then with various activities, targeting, you know, uh, the uh, 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 um, people that are at the end of affairs, UNFPA, you know, funded series of activities, you know, like uh, high level advocacy, uh, advocacy to wives of the governor, and then engagement of forum of wives of state governors. And then this really helped us gain political support, political will to the activities that we are doing. Today, in uh, a Bani state, the Babylon, you know that uh, one of the best things that happened to Nigeria was the passage of a uh, 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 VAP uh, Act during the time of uh, uh, President Jonathan. So today, we have a Bani passing that uh, VAP law because of the support of uh, uh, UNFPA. Then we have Imo passing uh, female genital mutilation uh, prohibition law and many other states like that. I want to give kudos to UNFPA for that. So many activities. We have engaged traditional circumcisers. As you know, that it is a traditional uh, practice. We engage them. We let them see that this thing is detrimental. It is causing harm to our female, you know, uh, folk. And then we, 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 we had their buying, many of them, Dantu, you know, 
And then the, uh, when we did uh, the uh, national flag off for of, uh, the joint program, I made sure that the national patron of traditional circumciser in Nigeria, and if he was from a Sioux state, I made sure he was part of that uh, launch. And so he, he, his eyes were, was open, and then all the activities that UNFP have funded culminated into all the traditional circumcisers coming together at Ibadan to hold a conference. That conference was funded by uh, uh, Guardian UK. You know, all of them came in one point to say, we are no longer going to circumcise our female children, and they dance soul, you know, they put, lay down their tools that it is no longer, you know, involved in 21st century. Female genital mutilation is a no-no in this century. And so then it was, you know, a crisis because women cannot talk. They are to be seen, they are not to be heard. They don't have a voice. There is no social inclusiveness. One powerful man who just sit down somewhere, more influence, uh, very influenced uh, um, man of influence, would just sit down somewhere and said, I, I, I said, this thing, we should be cutting it off. Where should our females be enjoying sex? As should I enjoy sex? It's a, it is one of the structural inequalities, you know, and managing from Fakata as ideology of uh, uh, African, African. Mrs. Obelao, you mentioned the uh, issue of traditional uh, practice. What about the men? Why do we let the men go for their circumcision and then we say the women cannot? Thank you so very much. Men go for circumcision. The kind of circumcision that is done for men is not as if the organ of men are being cut off. It is the first thing that is covering the penis that is being removed without any harm to the, you know, main organ, just the first thing. And so, and if it is not removed, you know, there could be infection because that may enter and then there could be infection. But when it is removed, then they can, you know, live in peace and then there will not be any form of, uh, form of infection. So that of men is even prescribed by the by religion circumcision of men is prescribed by religion it is not it is not prescribed for female in the case of female it is an organ organ of female uh, external female genitalia that is being removed and once it is removed like that that female is no longer complete this is a bear or a woman it is not and the person is no longer you know complete I remember the productive system that. of that. Please go ahead. Yes, I, I, was trying, I, was, I was trying to say that the reproductive system is unpacked. That woman cannot function well as a woman. And the organ, once it is removed, it cannot perform the function it ought to be performed. You know, but our forebearers, they didn't know. And they think that they know. They wouldn't have, you know, uh had the thing the practice you know like even myself when i did not during my uh, my time of ignorance my first born my daughter i circumcised her but when i got to know that ah this is a very serious arm to womanhood i have to stop it when i have another female child i didn't circumcise her and i became involved i go to kitalan you know, with the support of UNFPA and other, other, other stakeholders, we go to for the looks and trainings of, you know, our, our, our society to pass down the message of no, no to female genital mutilation. I want to thank the joint program of UNICEF and, uh, and uh, UNFPA, you know, for coming at the right time to come to save us. A lot of things were done. And today we are, have, we are having a resource for it. You know, the, the, the narrative, has, I mean, is changing. It's changing. We are, we, 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 we are seeing improvement, you know. You know we have about 1,000 communities declaring abandonment. Whilst of governors, they are championing it. And then the governors, they are having, we have, they are buying him. 
the legislators, they are passing law against female genital mutilation. And so the percentage rate and it is going, really going down because I, of the effort here and there. I remember my initial discussion with Alimatu and uh, she actually use, uh, used an analogy. She said, if you were to eat a banana, you peel, you peel it off and you eat the banana. And that's synonymous with the male organ. She said, but for example, if you are trying to eat strawberry and you begin to peel it off, you will damage it a little bit. And that's to her. And which, when you think about it, is synonymous to having female mutilation. Um, what, last question for you, Mrs. Obella, and please just go straight to uh, the um, answer here. How have you been educating people in the villages, the rural areas, as they're most likely uh, to continue the practice? Because you are talking about traditional practice here. These are people who are uneducated. How, I mean, how have you been able to educate them? Yes, yeah, thank you so very much. You know, in, uh, in uh, engaging them in meaningful discussion, you must have me, you, you must go down to their level and then use correct language and, uh, you know, do no harm to them while you are communicating with them. That you have been trained by UNFPA, you know, how to communicate, you know, our, our, our intention to communicate without damaging, you know, uh, any, any form of their culture. So we have been doing that, you know, the starting point was to pay advocacy. Mm -hmm. Advocacy to the traditional rulers that are custodial of culture, mm -hmm. you know, to have their buying. With the support of UNFP, uh, UNFPA, we started with that. We engage traditional rulers. Then we go for dialogue, intergenerational dialogue, you know, to, 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 to let them know that the practice is, is bad, it's affecting our women. We engage religious leaders, you know, to delete female genital mutilation from religion. And then today, if you enter community, you see communities telling you that we heard from our pastor. Our imam told us, you know, so we, have, we, we make sure that uh, we, we engage religious leaders, we engage traditional rulers, we engage men and women, you know, and nothing mothers. Um, uh, grandmothers, we engage them, youth, youth engagement. Mm -hmm. And then we make sure that uh, we set in every community we go, that uh, we, we set what we call community and um, anti FGM champion in community to the support of UNFPA. We have anti FGM champions in communities who go to do house to house, you know sensitization and making sure that uh, people, they conform with their, the declaration they made. You know, I said about 1,000 communities declare uh, their declaration of abandonment. You know, it was with Confia and uh, they were serious about it. So the, 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 the governance group was set in communities to continue to remind them and to check on them whether they are still doing it or not. But the result we are having is that they are no longer doing it. Every community that has declared abandonment are no longer doing it. Then the nurses. So in so other words, Mrs. Abelawo, Mrs. Abelawo, in other words, you send different people out into the communities to sensitize them. You talk to the traditional rulers, yes. the faith leaders, the community leaders, uh, gain their trust and also speak their language and let them know uh, that this is a bad practice. So obviously you've seen a decline in incidents of FGM. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure the discussion will still continue. I'd like to bring in some young men here and uh, the FGM campaign cannot really go on without the men and it has to be all inclusive. So today I'm so glad that we have some young male campaigners here with us. One of the uh, people that I have is a team leader and program director for Realize Global Empowerment Initiative, which is a community development organization for empowering women and girls. Um, th this um, individual has trained 600 plus champions in 29 secondary schools in Nigeria. Uh, the girls are trained as anti-FGM and advocates of other social devices, such as rape, and uh, child marriage. Please uh, welcome Mr. Ireti Adeshida. Mr. Ireti, 
Now, tell me, what's the reason for joining the anti-FGN campaign? You are a man. Why are you in this? Okay. What's your interest? Well, uh, once again, I want to appreciate uh, you for this platform. And also, I'm happy to see great women that has really motivated us. Uh, I see Alima too, uh, Ms. Comfort, and every one of us. Because uh, one thing about uh, FGM is has to do with passion. Mm -hmm. uh, that is what is driving people like us. It's not about gender. Uh, like uh, men and FGM, as they told me, maybe I could remember when you posted on his group, uh, on his page that uh, he is also trying to champion that campaign. Uh, so women came up and say you should leave this front line alone for the women. But uh, when it comes to issues of FGM, men have a major role to play. Uh, it's, uh, it's just like uh, what thing also he said was that when you are trying to address a disease, you are trying to cure a sickness or an illness, and you are not looking at the root cause. Who are the men? You know, from what we've been saying now, the chiefs, the committee leaders are the ones that enhance and enforce the that's the practice of FGM. And who are they in the in African communities? They are men. And it's good that we rise up so that women can go, well, okay, since I have a man that is standing up to support what we are doing, I think uh, we have a lot to do and that we have a lot of support. So that's why we're coming in to encourage that. And uh, personally, from my engagement with girls over the years, uh, sometimes psychologically, it has not really helped them. Sometimes we engage with girls who are volunteers. All of a sudden, they have mood swings. Mm. They have issues with their relationships and everything. And when I start engaging them, uh, the question you know that comes up is, ah, well, I've been having issues with my FGM. That's the circumcision I had that has been affecting my relationship. Uh, the mental health aspect is there and everything. And this is not really good at all. For a woman to be complete, she has to be fine in and out. And once her inside is damaged, there's nothing you can get from her. The uh, the, the face uh, does let me say the makeup and everything is just a cover up. But the reality is that we must stop damaging our women inside. And that is why we came up with this idea to see how we can engage girls across the country and also bring in boys for it. But the reality of it is that, for example, when you, when you are talking about law enforcement, you bring in policemen to, to be part of those who are the champions. The same thing also men are part of the enforcement. So that is why we are here and then we have passion. But the major thing is that it's not about either I'm a man or a woman. The major thing is passion and how we can help our women out there. And that is one of the things that drive us. Okay, thank you very much for that. Would you say that since you started the initiative, the rate of FGM incidents have reduced within the local areas? Well, uh, looking at uh, Ondo State, uh, Ondo State is also one of the states that we work in, uh, also work across the country, but we have a lot of uh, media engagement in Ondo State. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, uh, the Nigerian Demographic and Health uh, Survey, that was in 2013, Ondo State had 64% prevalence rate. But uh, we are happy and we're excited that the 2018 uh, survey showed that Ondo State has 43.7 percent. That's a reduction of 20.3 percent, which shows that uh, a lot of things are going on. And what we try to do is that uh, we try to engage communities, talk to people, and from feedback, a lot of people are you know, saying, "Oh, this thing has to stop." Though we still have them in some, you know, you know internal, that's the integral communities. There are some of these things that are still going on, but the thing has reduced, and there's a lot of awareness about. But we're happy with that reduction, and we hope that by God's grace, the next survey, as after the next uh, five years, mm -hmm. on those states is going to have reduction, and also Osho State too. Now there's a reduction, a kitty has a reduction too in that uh, aspect. So within the southwest, our champion, but that's a major catch, uh, catchment area. We're trying to see how we can reduce it and ensure that uh, our girls are free from this. Okay. What else do you do to promote your initiative? Well, one of the things we do is that uh, we try to change the narrative. Uh, we use what we call the bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say the young to adult approach. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. And when we were growing up in those days, we can't talk to our parents. Mm -hmm. But now, children are now the ones in charge. They are taking over choices. They are taking over people. There was one time uh, when the road safety in Nigeria started the campaign when it comes to seat belt usage. They went to schools and started the campaign from schools. So even my kid, anytime I'm driving, he tells me, Daddy, put on your seat belt. 
So there's that approach. So what we are trying to do is that we're working with teenage girls in schools. Mm -hmm. That is why we've chosen secondary schools because they have influence with their mothers, their parents, mm -hmm. and they were able to. So what we're doing is that develop their capacity, let them know how to engage because level of engagement varies. Mm -hmm. And the way you engage with an adult is different from the way you engage with your pair, your, your, your fellow friends. And we are able to work with them in that area. Uh, we gave them an assignment in uh, December. We had 60 girls. And we told them that during the December break, talk to at least 10 people about the FGM and ask them questions, what they know about it. And you could see the amazing result we got. We are trying to compile it into a report now. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of this lockdown, we're not able to follow it up. But after this lockdown, we are still going to meet them to work on that. So that's 60 to 600. Mm -hmm. So and we also tell, once you get to the 10, tell the 10 to talk to others. So there's a ripple effect. And mm -hmm. what we try to back up is that Tango with uh, what the global media campaign is doing to support media advocates. So we are on radio to talk about it. And the angle we are also bringing in is uh, bringing in psychologists mm -hmm. because the mental health aspect is very important. A lot of women are wounded. They needed people to talk to. They needed people to tell them that there's a way out. Yes, this has happened. Let's solve the problem for those who are in, uh, those who already are affected, the survivors. And how can we prevent this? And thank God for Ondo State. What we are trying to do with Realize again is that with the other NGOs in Ondo State, we are trying to pass the Ondo State version of violence against people provision uh, uh, law. And that's once passing into law. And very soon we are hoping to have that. So with that, FGM is also going to be a thing of the past in Ondo State because when you know that this law, you have to you'll be sent to jail if you go into it, then you know you have to think twice. So these are some of the things we try to do to ensure that there's a sustained uh, input. And a lot of parents have been calling us to help, uh, to encourage us on what we're doing. And lastly, there's something we also do. We call it street impact. Mm -hmm. We go to the communities. Uh, there's what we call people like taking pictures with uh, props, you know, when you go for weddings. So we we'll go to marketplaces, have this end FGM, stop FGM. We we'll go there, we we'll talk to the mamas in Yoruba language and different, you know, in Pigeon. Oh, mama. <laughs> This thing will make you stop and move. Then we take pictures with the mama. The mama is so excited. So gradually with that joy, mama is thinking of, oh, I need to change. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, the next person we have, another gentleman, he's the founder of Youth Packs Pan-Africa, a youth organization committed to the promotion of human rights and every form of gender-based related issues in Nigeria. He's a social media advocate on UNICEF End Cotton's campaign is the graduate of Guardian Media Campaign to End FGM. Welcome, Raymond Opani. Yeah, I'm sure Raymond is there. Okay. I am here. Right. Just put that in everyone. Yeah. everyone. The first question I'm not going to ask you too. What's your reason for getting involved in the campaign against FGM? Okay, thank you so much uh, for getting me here, everyone. Um, can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. And yes. Okay, so what happened is that uh, back in 2009, um, I started volunteering for an organization, an NGO working uh, with women and girls. Mm -hmm. And during that those period, I had the opportunity for like six years, I had the opportunity to work on a lot of women related issues and young girls. And part of one of the projects I did then was on vesico vagina fistula, which is a very, very um, serious issue. So I had the opportunity to work in a boy state because a boy state had one of the national obstetric fistula uh, center and then in Kano. I also went to Kano to work with her um, on, on the project. And during the period, as I was learning on the project, I now got to hear about FGM. Of course, <laughs> growing up, I don't have any, I didn't know about FGM then. So I, I started hearing about FGM, BDM, like trying to get connections between them. And part of one of the things I had then was that there is a a connection between both uh, to an extent because at some point when people are being caught, depending on the person cutting, they often get to either pamper with the bladder or get to the person gets infected and a lot of other things. So after that project, um, I started really hearing you know, my consciousness goes to the whole FGM thing. And during the period, I now got to know that every state, which is where I am from, Mm -hmm. And I was also residing, residing was actually the second in, uh, second highest in prevalence, in FGM prevalence in Nigeria. Right. But much more to that was that 
not just that Ebony was the second highest, it's also that my local government area, which is Africa, I am from Africa, was also the second highest prevalent in the state also. So, like, it's, I really, really started thinking about Bogote. And as God will have it, in 2015, I had the opportunity to, uh, to be trained. I think that was where I met Ebony Comfort. You know, to be trained alongside other advocates on the whole MGM, we went through an academy where I got to learn in depth from the beginning yeah. till the end what this MGM is really about. Mm -hmm. And while going home from that train, I remember I have three sisters. I have three sisters. I was not born in the rural area, I was born in the city, and none of my sisters were caught. Mm -hmm. So I was now beginning to relate, and none of my sisters were promiscuous. I certainly understand that MGM may not really be an issue of promiscuity, but an issue of training. Mm -hmm. If somebody is accurately trained, well trained, when you set a path for somebody to go, the person will follow that path, irrespective of whatever practice that is done on the person. Mm -hmm. And really, I really, really got interested on the fact because most of the things I have done have been, I mean, I've, I've been privileged to work with a lot of women that are very, very, very resourceful. And I couldn't really stand the chance of them, you know, having to really imagine the pain they must have got. So what now brought me really, really deep into FGM was the fact that I knew I had a strength, and my strength was my knowledgeable voice. I could understand uh, exactly what was happening. It just took the light, sorry. So I could just understand exactly what... Um, so I could understand... This was what I mean. Sorry, one minute, I just need to understand. Okay, thank you. So, um, so I could understand the pain that they have likely passed through, and I knew I had a knowledgeable voice. I can interpret, I can understand, and I have a very strong passion for medicine. Um, about 65 to 70 percent of my friends are all medical students. I wanted to study medicine, but somehow I didn't get to work. I have large pool of my friends who are medical students and medical doctors. So I have I had this great connection to really devote MGMT and I could also interpret it to people and especially to fellow young people. Because I also understand that if this thing has to stop, it has to start with young people. It's not about the elderly ones anymore. And for me as a young person, and for me as a young person, if I can interpret what I understand about this thing to other girls who will, I mean who I connect with, to other fellow guys who I connect with. Because the issue of FGM is the fact that if you are not directly affected, you are indirectly affected. That's because we have, we have our friends, we don't have our friends, we have our sisters, we have our teachers, we have our partners. I mean, we have women surrounding us to do a lot of things. So if you say, ah, it's not my business, I mean, ah, it's not my concern. Direct, but then indirectly, it's concerning to you. Because if you have a partner who is only suffering from shock, who is always suffering from trauma, automatically it affects the person's productivity, which indirectly also, which directly also connects to how much you can produce. So I started using my voice to engage a lot of other young people to talk about it. At some point, people were started laughing at me, say, why am I always talking about women-related issues? But that was my strength, because a lot of people really, really started you know, hearing from me, and then they started working on it. And a couple of years later, I got connected with the uh, UNICEF and Cutting Girls, and then I was also I also underwent the training as a social media advocate, which also like opened me up more to using the social media space to you know talk about the issues of female genital mutilation and then to engage people. And over the years, I've also been privileged to like consult and train for some organizations in very very rural areas in Cross River State, in Ivory State, and some other parts of Nigeria where I have come come to use my voice and my knowledge and my experience, because it's not just about reading it, it's not just about attending the train. I have stayed in communities where women are suffering. I worked in a community in a boy state called Nishago, in a boy state where I worked with a woman. I was in the traditional ruler's um, 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 office, like in his place, and the traditional ruler's palace, and the man was saying that it doesn't happen here. Yeah. And one woman right in front of him, one, of, one woman right in front of him told him, uh, Your Highness, I'm very, very sorry, but uh, it still happens. Mm -hmm. That people used to carry, even though that is not happening within the community, that some people still used to carry their children and go to the neighboring community to court. 
you know. So, so there are a lot of things, but I started really adding my voice to the campaign to say, how do we, as young people, start putting our voice? Because the elderly people, the grandmothers who have been doing this are facing out. Mm. If we do not start taking advantage of the knowledge that we have, mm. for instance, if they say, uh, I made this personal recharge search by myself, they say it's as a result of promiscuity. But I have worked in a particular community that has a high rate of promiscuity, which also most of the women are caught. So you can no longer connect cutting yes. to being or not being promiscuous. Mm -hmm. I have also worked with women who are who were not caught, girls that were not, but they are doing amazingly well in their sector. They are doing so well, and then you can't trace that uh, to the sector. And let me also end by saying this. Um, you know, most times, a lot of people said, uh, if you are not part of this, if you are not part of, uh, if you are not caught, you are not, a, you, are not you are not a complete person. Let me use myself as, 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 a, as a man. In my case, they run this uh, traditional, um, sorry, what is the, the initiation rites that they do for men. Now, I was born in the city, so I was not even born in the rural areas to have So while growing up, some people used to say, Raymond, if you don't undergo this, you are not a man. You cannot talk to us. You, are, you cannot do this and that and that. But I have grown to a point where, by training, I've been able to train myself. Mm -hmm. And let me also make this because I am not what I want to say. I am not. I don't feel inferior when I talk about it around the world because it's also my strength. I didn't go to school. I told you guys that I wanted to study medicine. Mm -hmm. So finally, I didn't study medicine. I didn't go to any university. I didn't get any degree. But I have used my strength of, of not having what what people feel like this is what I need to have to make impact. But as someone that doesn't have a degree, I've been able to impact a lot of people. I've been able to self-train myself that when I go back to my community, nobody cares anymore about if I underwent all those uh, initiation rights. And I want to say that to the girls and women also. It's not, the culture was actually, it should be made to suit human beings. Human beings should not be made to suit the culture. We shouldn't align ourselves to what the culture is saying. Yeah. Rather, we should adjust the culture to suit what we're doing because we are constantly changing and the culture should also be fine-tuned to also change alongside those. That's yeah. what I have to say. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Here's the reason why we say that it's renewing because it, you should continuously renew your mindset. So from what you've said so far, some of these things that we've been doing is based on ignorance. Everybody just keeps on saying, oh, tradition, tradition. So it's based on ignorance, so to speak. One last question I have for you, and for the sake of time, I just want you to go straight to the answer. You have a network of young people across 15 African countries, including Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda. How have you been able to manage the campaign given the difference in cultural beliefs and tradition? Because we are talking so, about- So basically what we have done, yeah. Yeah, so, so we, we also understand the the differences in culture, the differences in belief, and all that. But what we have hammered on, what we have really, really um, hammered most on, is yeah. on the impact on everybody, on human beings, on us as humans, irrespective yeah. of where you're coming from. Yeah. So it is now left for people in our network to, to adopt or to find um, applicable strategies that, that can suit them. For us, we are not giving people strategies to use in their communities. We get to hammer on the uh, on the negative effect, on the impact, how it affects our productivity, how it affects our mindset. That's what we talk about as young people that will eventually grow up to take positions. But it is now for our networks, for the young people in our network to adapt applicable solutions that can. Of course, we also know that it's not going to be easy. But that's why they also have to keep fine tuning and finding the best ways of engaging the people in their communities. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, there are so many of these initiatives. Well, we're focusing on Nigeria a bit today on this particular topic. There's so many initiatives going all over the place. We'd like to know whether even the Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria is aware of all this. Is there any some sort of coordination? Is there any collaboration of all these uh, different uh, groups springing up? So I'm going to call on um, Dr. Christopher Ukombo to um, tell us a bit about these uh, little initiatives, whether there is even a policy 
uh, regarding um, FGM, anti-FGM within uh, the Federal Ministry of Health. Dr. Christopher Okobo is the Director and Head of Division for Gender, Adolescents, Schooling, Health and the Elderly for, you know, within uh, the Federal, capi uh, federal uh, Capital Territory of Nigeria. So, Dr. Okobo, could you tell us briefly, yes. is there any policy against FGM? You've been unmuted. Is there any policy against FGM? I think we have a frozen screen with Dr. Okobo. Maybe I'll go to uh, somebody else whilst he's trying to sort himself out with the screen. Um, wow. While still uh, trying to sort himself out. I'll quickly go uh, to the next angle we're going to take here is the legal aspect of it. We have um, a lady here. She's the vice president of the Association of Women Barristers and International Gender-Based Violence. She has developed and uh, deliver training on FGM, domestic abuse, and forced marriage for health, education, and social care professionals on harmful traditional practices. She developed policy on violence against women and girls for the uh, Crown Prosecution Service in the United Kingdom here, so as to improve the effectiveness of the UK justice system. Uh, she's also trained law enforcement and uh, prosecutors on gender-based violence in Namibia on behalf of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, doc, uh, sorry, Neelam Sakaria, she's actually, uh, she was born in Kenya, she's Indian, but uh, is living in the UK. Welcome, uh, Neelam. Neelam, could you just tell me about the uh, protection order in the United Kingdom? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Anna. And can I just say thank you for arranging this? And it's been really really helpful and I find that each time I have hear one of these sessions I learn something new and we should thank the survivors for their accounts today it must be very difficult for them okay um, in the UK we have um, what's uh, something called female genital mutilation protection orders and they were introduced in June of 2015 and it's an application that's made in the family court and uh, either the um, victim herself or uh, the police on her behalf or her solicitor or the local authority can make an application if she's at risk of FGM mm -hmm. or if the FGM has been undertaken perhaps in another country and she's been taken overseas and we need to bring her back into the UK. Mm -hmm. One key thing is that um, uh, the female genital mutilation protection orders work hand in hand with the, with the uh, criminal law in the UK. The yeah. female genital mutilation protection orders applications are made in the family court. And if somebody then breaches that order, then they can be prosecuted in the criminal courts. Right. Um, now, I just want to create a scenario. I have a daughter and I've taken my daughter to Africa to have the FGM done. My grandma's done it. Everybody, my, all the females in my family, they've done it. Yeah. And uh, are you going to tell me that that's illegal? Because I've taken her away from the UK here and I've taken her to Africa. Well, if you're ordinarily resident, because that's the term in law, living in the UK and this is your home and you take your daughter who's born here over to overseas uh, right. to have FGM performed, then yes, you can be prosecuted. Right. Um, what if the child is over there what can she do to safeguard herself she's british and she's seen grandma uh you know talking about it with some other female members of the family saying that next she's next we're going to do it on uh at the weekend what do you think the child can do maybe she's probably about 17 or 18. Well, the difficulty is it's very difficult for children to safeguard themselves overseas. Mm -hmm. But what we've got in the UK, we've got, uh, you know, referred to by other members today, we've got lots of safeguarding policies in place. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if the child was in UK and they told their teacher at the age of 17, I'm going to be taken uh, overseas, uh, mm -hmm. say, to um, Guinea to have FGM this weekend, mm -hmm. well, that teacher has a duty to report that to the police. 
so yeah. that that child can be protected. Right. Similarly, if that same child had told her social worker, you know, my family, they're taking me to uh, Guinea and I think I'm going to have FGM performed on me, then again, that social worker's got a duty to do something with that information mm -hmm. and tell the police so that she can be protected. Now, how are we bridging the gap between the UK and African countries practicing FGM? Well, we do know that um, DFID is investing a lot of money in Africa to make sure that there's awareness raising campaigns and that you're engaging with local champions in each of the African countries. We know that some of the research that's been recently conducted last year, that out of the 28 African countries, 22 have specific laws against FGM. Mm -hmm. And today we've talked about Nigeria. We know that in Nigeria, we've got the Violence Against Person Prohibition Act and the Child Rights Act, and that there's some work being done by the UNFPA. Right. There's, there's a lot of learning that we're sharing with other countries. And you know whether we speak to prosecutors, for example, I speak to prosecutors in Kenya and share experiences of the work that we've done here. So one thing that's clear, the law by itself can't make a difference. It really needs all of the activities that some of our speakers have touched on today, whether it's young people engaging, whether it's community groups, whether it's health professionals getting involved. And for example, Mama CL in her account, talked about how when she went for her midwifery appointment and, the, and she spoke to her doctor, the doctor made a report and realized that she should have done something about that FGM before. Mm -hmm. So everybody really needs to work together, whether it's health, education, social care, um, young people, uh, the government, you know, the law can't uh, eradicate FGM by itself. It needs people to work towards it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I was hoping to get somebody from Nigeria because I do, I'm not sure whether Mujurai Ogulano is here. She actually wanted to touch on what they're doing in Nigeria. If she's mm. here, um, maybe she can speak up because I want to find out whether she shares the same views as you have, Neelam. Uh, because this is an important aspect. A lot of people don't know it's illegal. Some people still think that they can still do it secretly in the, uh, in the UK here. So, and uh, say for example, somebody's had it done and later on tells a classmate, do you know that um, the reason why I couldn't come to school last week was because I had FGM done? Would you say that little, you know, would you say that friend or the classmate has a duty to tell the teacher? Well, no, the, no. The, going now? No, because the mandatory reporting duty applies to health professionals, educational professionals, and social care professionals. And the, and the child has to be under the age of 18 uh, at the time that the FGM has been performed, and then when they tell the teacher or the social worker as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think, um, I'm not sure whether Dr. Kogbo is back with us because he had a frozen screen. Um, I can't even see him here. Okay, we're going to um, somebody else here because we keep on talking about this FGM. A lot of people is like, get a grip on yourself. Um, I had it done. Everybody, in the, all the female relatives, uh, they've had it done. Uh, they didn't have any problems. Why should you have a problem? Mm. And like what uh, Mama Silla said, and including Ali Matu as well, there is a psychological effect of uh, having FGM. I could remember when I was having a discussion with Dr. Comfort, uh, because we've touched on this FGM before, about six years ago, and this was showing us graphic details. I mean, it, it was really, really horrible. And um, when she was talking about it, and um, also saying that two openings, you know, I just couldn't imagine it until she had to actually lecture me in my 50s. I didn't even know. So at times some people go without knowing, maybe during the time of childbirth, that's when they know, or when they start exhibiting some form of uh, what you call mental health issues. And that's where I bring in my next speaker. She's actually a psychotherapist who specializes in supporting survivors of sexual abuse. Uh, survivors of sexual abuse, yes. She's the founder of the Dahlia Project, UK's first specialist therapeutic service for FGM survivors. Um, she's an international lecturer on FGM and global speaker on gender rights. Um, welcome, Leila Hussein. She's from Somalia and she's going to share with us um, the psychological effects of having FGM at a tender age. Are you there, Leila? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. 
uh, this is definitely a conversation that needs to be had more often um, because I think sometimes when we get together like this, we feel like it, this has to happen once. So I would like to encourage for these conversations to continue. Mm -hmm. I think before we go, I really uh, tap into the whole psychological impact. I think it's important to understand the social impact this has, the social uh, uh, um, uh, uh, this has on, 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 on communities that practice this particular uh, uh, um, uh, practice. Um, one, we are, all of us are having actually made, and, and I like to use the right language here because as a therapist, I have been trained to name what my client is describing. So maybe what I would like to describe even in our conversation, because what the conversation we are all having, actually, we are talking about policing women and girls' bodies. Mm -hmm. I think we need to call it, for, we need to call that out. Mm -hmm. And especially as people of color, uh, people of color, uh, those who are, who are African or whether we're from Asia, there's a sense always when we talk about these issues, we mm -hmm. have to downplay mm -hmm. what's happening to our girls. Yes. We always have to make it sound a little bit okay or is a separate issue. That itself has a that that itself has a psychological impact on all of us mm -hmm. because we are constantly told, well, you know, be careful, this is a traditional practice. Mm -hmm. Pinning a child, so just picture a little child mm -hmm. relying and trusting family members. Now take that child pin them to a table, publicly open their legs, touch their genitalia, just touching, forget about cutting. That itself already has an implication on someone's psyche mm -hmm. and emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. The cutting comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we must remember it's not, the psychological impact is not just a child, somebody was cut. It's the fact that this violation takes place publicly by the people you trust the most. Mm. which is very rare actually it's one of the most rare violence you can imagine it's very public so mm. what that does to a child mm. it says one you're not valuable enough that no one needs to hear you mm. and actually every time myself as a survivor and I hear my sisters like Alima and Mama Silla speak it feels like even in these platforms we have to constantly prove this is a bad thing mm. that itself has psychological impact Right. So we must be very mindful of that at all times. So these are the, some, I'll give you a list of some of the psychological impacts that women have. Mm -hmm. PTSD, post-traumatic uh, um, PTSD is very common. Mm -hmm. Severe depression. Mm -hmm. Flashbacks are very common. Actually, health professionals like Comfort, Joy Clark, who are, who are on these calls, one of the best ways they, they pick up women who, who, are, who are undergone FGM, especially if you are a midwife, or a gynecologist, at some point you'll be doing some sort of vaginal examination. You will find those women will have flashbacks as they are mm -hmm. in that. Because you have to remember the last time uh, uh, a woman, the last time you sat in that particular position, it was not a, a healthy, good experience mm -hmm. because it was when you were violated. And that will happen for me. And if I go to the next bit, which is sexual dysfunction, mm -hmm. last time you were on your back, and something touched your genitalia, it was again a form of violence, meaning women who experiences will absolutely have issues with sex and intimacy. And trust is something, a lot of us who've been through this, and, and by the way, everything I'm listing, it's something that anyone who's going through any form of physical violence will experience. So FGM is no different than any other form of violence. So we have to be, even though it's important we highlight this, all of us activists, campaigners, professionals, Yes, we want this to be highlighted, but we cannot keep this as a separate issue. It, it, this is about violating women and children. It's one of the worst forms of violence. I remember a couple of years ago, I was training uh, police officers and one of them came up to me and he said, great presentation, Mr. Hussein, especially when I was describing the psychology, but he said, if I walked into a room and this happened to a child, I wouldn't even describe it as a, a, a FGM this is a serious sexual assault against a child. Mm. So as Africans, as people of color, we need to stop this conversation of pretending when it comes to our own kids, we have to be PC about it. We have to call it for what it is because when you call it for what it is, you are not going to be dealing with the issue. So as a therapist, what I have, what I have to deal with my clients at all times, my job is to name what they're going through. When a client explains to me that this has happened to her, and then says, I was married off as a child. I cannot tell her she was married off as a child. I have to, as a therapist, remind her she was raped by an adult because that is the right definition. So when we are having, again, the, having these conversations publicly, when we are saying this is a cultural practice, this is a traditional practice, 
the woman who's sitting in that audience is being told her issue is not big enough. And that's where a lot of the psychological impact still continues, even for, for me. Uh, so I'm just saying for those of us who are even in this conversation, when we've been told this is not a big deal, you're saying our experience is not a big deal. So we must be very mindful of that. Lack of trust, fear, panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I know every time I come to these uh, conversations, I have to be very mindful that I need to take care of myself after this because we have to relive this over and over again, which mm -hmm. why I really appreciate when Alima and Mama Silla, who are, by the way, they are professional women, they are experts in this, but they are also sharing their, 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 their voices to this, which is absolutely very key, and we must be very mindful of that. Mm -hmm. um, again, this idea, what causes a lot of the psychological impact, it's this societies, patriarchal societies, that are there to constantly police women's bodies. Women do not, they don't need to prove to anybody mm -hmm. whether they're promiscuous or not. That is not the conversation we need to be having. Because what that does, just because a woman has a bean cut, oh great, she's not promiscuous. That's, again, we, we, it's the same thing. Whether you cut a woman or not cut, if you're, if you're basing her status mm -hmm. on her sexual experiences, mm -hmm. the control is the same, whether you use a knife or not. So it's very important when we're talking about the psychological impact, it's not necessarily when a, the knife cuts you. It's way before that. It's the society that you're in. It's the community that you're, you've you been raised by. It's the family you've been raised by. I think it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. However, in my clinic, the Dahlia Project, we're not just a counseling service. We are there to actually educate women about their rights. Mm -hmm. It's very important that women learn about their rights. Mm -hmm. That's their fundamental right for them to know this. So this is, again, a safe space that is actually created here. So... I obviously, in terms of the law, every girl deserves justice, but none of us want a girl to go through what we went through. Because mm -hmm. the, mo the moment we, there's a, a case, for me, it just proves we failed. There was one mother, because he, I, I was cut, my, my mother, was, my family was very educated and professionals, but they still practice this. Mm -hmm. But the problem has been, she was also brought up in a community, a patriarchal society, where she needed to make sure I got married to the right people. She needed to make sure, you know, that I was in the right families. But where in the world that's not, where in the world marriageability is not important? Just look at the royal family in the UK. You know, we just two, two years ago, we were having a conversation whether, you know, uh, uh, Meghan Markle was a divorcee because marriage is very important to all communities. So we have to stop pretending that this is just the, these crazy Africans are doing it. It's a global issue and we need to speak about it in that way. But one, well, one last thing I would like to say actually, and, and it's very rare a lot of us Africans get together in a space like this. And, and this is why I really wanted to join this conversation. Mm. What we all must do, it's we, we as Africans, we need to be outraged for our own children. Mm -hmm. not, I, and I won't be told that I shouldn't be outraged because I, let me tell you a few times uh, by those who are not Africans would constantly tell me I am being too angry or I am being too pissed off or, you know, I should be really calm when I speak about this. Because let me tell you, every 11 seconds, a girl's being cut. Mm -hmm. We've been on this school for nearly, it's going to be two hours, I think an hour and a half. We are talking about hundreds that have been cut already. Especially right. during this COVID-19, many will be cut. Mm -hmm. But there isn't similar outrage. If white girls were going through the exact same thing, I promise you, There'll be special forces. There'll be a march happening right now. So mm -hmm. as Africans, we really need to reflect on why is it when it comes to our own children, we're not allowed to be outraged. So we should be outraged about this. We shouldn't be playing devil's advocate in these spaces mm -hmm. because white people, people in privileged spaces in the West, would never allow for that to happen to their daughters. And if they did, there's a consequence for it as well. So I'm going to leave at that point. Can I just quickly ask you a question there, Leila? Um, mm. we're talk would you say that the effect of uh, the FGM on a young girl is different from an adult? No, no, no. It's the same. Psycholo obviously, if a, a woman is being cut during her adult life, it means she's had maybe a better childhood. Mm -hmm. But when you cut a child, you send a message. Because cutting, like I said, it's not the cutting. The cutting has a big message behind it. It means when we cut you like this, mm. so pub and I want to keep going back to publicly because it's mm -hmm. done publicly, yeah. right? It's announced, there's a party. Mm -hmm. What you're saying to a child in that situation is you no longer have a say about your body. Mm. We own your body. It belongs to us. Actually, in my clinic, when we are to, when we, to, we have, a, I do this exercise with the women where we ask, where I ask which part of their bodies belong to them. 
whenever they get to their genital area, it always belongs to the husband. It's never hers mm. because that message was sent very early in her life. Mm. So absolutely, any, anyone who gets to violate at any time, it, 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 all these things that I've listed, it's mm. there. And actually, even those, uh, maybe Comfort can respond to this, but um, if you have not even experienced FGM and you worked with women mm. who've had, someone like Comfort or Joy Clark or Neelam will experience secondary trauma, even though they might not have been cut. Yeah. But there's an emotional sense that mm -hmm. even they feel, mm -hmm. which is that, especially those who, are, who work in this environment, there's yeah. secondary trauma that happens. So we actually have, because we all come from similar communities anyway. Right. So that's also something to be mindful of when we do this work. Okay. Last question for you. During the counseling sessions, do you normally bring other members of the family uh, in? Do you involve them so that they are aware of the psychological effect of what they had done previously? Um, in, we don't actually, because it's a, it's a confidential counselling service. Yeah. However, if there is a need, we've had situations where we had a mother, mm -hmm. but that was, a, that was done privately because we run a group therapy. Right. So if somebody wanted to bring, because one of the big things that comes up is the relationship between the mother and daughter, because we are told we should, we should understand that actually what we do, we create a space for our women to be angry at their mothers, but it's within a safe space because they have the right to be angry. But also we sometimes had a situation where we brought the mother in mm. and there was a conversation that had between them. Mm. And actually what that does, it brings peace because, it, because you need, and I, I mean, I'll give an example. I have experience with my mother mm -hmm. where I, because I was, I was always very close to my mother. I understood why this happened, but there was a, the anger kept coming because I have a daughter myself because I was even struggling to give my daughter an injection. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand why she would arrange for this. And I remember the therapist helped us understand that's, I had to accept that that was my mother's truth. Mm -hmm. And my mother had to accept that is how I'm feeling about what's happened. And we both had to respect that. Yeah. But, and, and the therapist gave us a really good uh, uh, tool to use, which was whenever those feelings, negative things came up, we mm -hmm. had to focus on my daughter who's not cut and her grandchild who's not cut. So we had to focus on that positive aspect. Right. So, th so those instances, and sometimes I know... Um, my, some of my the two therapists that I work with at Dahlia mm -hmm. uh, which I haven't experienced but they, there was a time when a, a partner might have walked in into mm -hmm. the one-to-one -one sessions because they that was something that they wanted to, they wanted someone to mediate a conversation mm -hmm. and and we're and, and I've always said you know it's a, it's a counseling service it's not your typical counseling service where we tell our women how the service runs what mm -hmm. we do it's we listen to the needs of our women and yeah. we're always constantly adapting so we're like an open adapting clinic so we're constantly adapting to what the women need Okay, thank you so much for that. Very insightful. I'd like to bring back uh, Dr. Okobo, uh, the um, director for the Federal Ministry of Health, Federal Capital of uh, Federal Capital Territory of Nigeria. Is it back there with us? I hope the screen is okay now. Uh, Dr. Okobo. Can you hear me now, Dr. Okobo? Can you hear me now, Dr. Okobo? Hello, Dr. Okobo? Yes, good evening. Okay, good, good evening. Me. Let's go quickly um, to the questions. Is there any FGM policy in place? Yes, there is a policy. Right. But it's a new policy. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Okay, it's a new policy, and um, this policy is to run between uh, 2020 to uh, 2014. Right. It's a new policy and it's succeeding an old policy that ran from 2013 right. uh, to um, um, 2018. Yeah. Okay. So there's, there is a new policy. There is a policy. So um, the campaign against FGM is recognized in Nigeria. Yes, very well, very well. So, um, apart from the policy, mm -hmm. um, uh, FGM is seen as uh, a harmful traditional practice in Nigeria. Right. And uh, prior to the recognition, prior to the recognition of female genital mutilation, right. Um, they uh, that um, the Nigeria as a country observed mm -hmm. that this practice is going on. Right. We we have uh, been um, quite critical about harmful traditional practices as well. Right. So it was uh, in a survey in 1998 that um, um, we found out that 
this emergency army was actually quite prevalent. And this was why in uh, 2002, which was when we did the first policy. We don't know what's going on with uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Okobo. I don't know whether you're <laughs> sort okay. of like muted so, yourself by mistake. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, okay. we so are you hearing me now? Yes, we can. We can hear you now. Okay. So um, uh, this new policy. Okay. So um, this new policy. Uh, it's. Um, a move away from what we have been doing. Right. Although the old policy, which was between 2013 and uh, 2017, has um, made us to uh, be able to navigate the issues of emergency and mutilation to an extent that we now have a reduction in right. the practice. Um, in 2013, our NDHS, the National uh, Demographic Health Survey, um, put this at uh, 20 percent but in 2018 it's um, been found to have reduced to now 20 uh, to just 20 percent of all women in nigeria so okay. i would say that um, um, we have made a, a, lot of, a lot of progress okay that's good to know that you've made a lot of progress so uh, would i be right to assume that it is illegal in nigeria to have fgm to have FGM done on um, a girl or a uh, woman? Or you wouldn't know that? I think Dr. Okobo is frozen again. Um, now, uh, what I just want to find out, uh, Hawa is here, Hawa sister. Do you want to uh, quickly share your, um, yes. your personal experience of having the FGM done? How was this? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? How was this? We cannot hear you. We've unmuted you. We cannot hear you. Okay. I think at this point in time, we'll go because our time is overspent. And um, I just want to take one or two comments from uh, a representative of uh, UN Women here, Alice Fox. What's your take on, um, on uh, FGM? Very speedy, but I just wanted to say how honoured I am to be with such an amazing group of people coming together to fight FGM. Thank yeah. you for including me and for me, it was really good of you to do that. I will just say that one of the things I think we really do need to look at is the effect of COVID-19 yeah. on um, FGM. And um, for example, law enforcement, in some cases it may be more of a deterrent for people to stop carrying out FGM, but on the other hand, law enforcement may well have their eye off FGM on other issues as well, or be overburdened. Healthcare um, pathways that women who are in danger of suffering FGM may well be focused on COVID-19, so those pathways are no longer there. Um, I think um, FGM ought to be very much part of risk mitigation response integrated into gender-based violence and child protection procedures. And I think we need to be calling for that now, not in a two weeks time. We need to, to bring that together. Um, and that means the big agencies, UN, go straight to the top to ask for this. We're not separate. FGM isn't something separate. It's part of gender-based violence. Um, we need to make sure that our voices continue to be heard. Fabulous event today. We need more of this. We need another one in a month's time because it's so easy for the voices that are necessary to talk about CB19, but it means that things like FGM will um, can go under the radar and there will be more incidences of FGM, not less. This is UN Women speaking here. Mm -hmm. Um, social distancing means that there'll be less community empowerment and a lot of people today have spoken about 
the importance of community of engagement agreement because of social distancing that's less likely to happen girls are more at risk because schools are closed um, communities are not so uh, in touch with what's going on um, and I think there's no room to let up on our energy and our desire to make sure this subject FGM, female genital mutilation, remains on everybody's agenda. We mustn't stop. Right. Um, we also think that economic uncertainty means that um, people, families are more uh, inclined, uh, girls are more susceptible to be married off. And if that means they need to have FGM, families won't think about alternatives. They'll go straight ahead and do it if it means that economically they'll be better off for that. Mm -hmm. um, and it means that it's more likely that there will be child brides, which we were doing so much work to stop. I think that's going to come back up on the agenda. We need to, everybody here today is amazingly articulate. And I think use your voices, please use your voices in your networks. UN Women at the moment, UN Women UK, we have put um, FGM as part of our Draw a Lion campaign and I just want to say that at the moment we are continuing to try and run our education uh, programs with religious le leaders, families and the cutters as well to increase the understanding just as people have spoken about today. Um, we are continuing to work and advocate as we can but we ourselves at UM Women are finding it very hard to find those normal platforms because they've been taken over by COVID-19. So I think we need to find a way into those platforms. We need to make the space. And you've all got the most amazing voices. Please do that. Um, we are actually, uh, I think we can do that and strengthen the partnerships we already have, particularly with men and boys. UN Women is so, uh, a, this is one of our key things that without men and boys at the table, we're not going to really have the strongest voices that we need at this time. And so working with all the um, male partners it, um, who run these amazing groups is so important. So finally, I'll just say, um, as well as I think it's amazing today that on the agenda is the support of survivors of FGM, moving people through victimhood into survivorship is something that we're talking about now at UN Women. Um, mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that the counselling, the holistic support, the financial independence that those girls and women are asking for. They're saying, what would, when we ask, what would make a difference to your lives? So many of them say, we want education, training to leave independent lives, to make our own choices, and then make choices for our daughters as well. I'm going to be quiet now, but thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you very much, Alice. You've just rounded everything all up. Our time is over spent here, but maybe another 10 minutes to uh, take some questions here. I have one question. Um, I think maybe Comfort or one of the survivors might be able to answer this, or um, uh, Dr. Tony over there. The question is, how important do the speakers think of the use of terminology? Is it more important to say cutting or more important to say mutilation? Probably Comfort would be the best person to uh, answer this question. Have you? Yes. You want me to yes. take this? Yes. yes. I think it depends on individual as well, because I've worked with so many survivors and some prefer to call it mutilation because they feel that they, they believe that they've been mutilated. And some will say to me, well, I don't see it as mutilation. I see it as cutting. So again, it depends. Like we've rightly said earlier, the Americans prefer to call it female genital cutting, but I prefer to call it mutilation, again, to show the extent of damage to the vulva area. And I guess um, some of the survivors feel really strongly that they've been mutilated. So again, maybe we can hear from one of the survivors how they feel or um, what they prefer to be called. Mm. How well, do you want to take that? Can you hear us now, How well, Do you want to take that? Would you say it's a mutilation or a cutting? How well, is it? For some reason, you're not putting on your... Sorry? We cannot hear you. Okay, I'll go to Alimatu. 
Alimati, do you want to take the question? Would you say it's cutting or mutilation, or should we go back to the analogy of the banana and strawberry? <laughs> it's best to ask that individual because mm. FGM has very names in the yeah. communities that women are from right. um, even two communities don't call it the same so it's always best to ask mm. the community that we want to um, engage with what yeah. do you call it because yeah. we might say FGM or we but like Layla said I, I think I'm going to change that again uh, because we have to call it what it is. And for me, I, like Comfort said, I use mutilation. All right. And, um, but um, because I work in communities, I sometimes ask the community that I go into, mm -hmm. what would you like for me to call it? Okay. Sometimes the women will say, just call it this way. And then afterwards, they then pick up the mutilation themselves. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is, why is Osho State, uh, why does it still have, the highest percentage of 15 to 49 of women in Nigeria being caught. Is Mrs. Obelawo there? Just straight to the question, just give us the answer. Why is Oshun State, um, why does it still have the highest percentage uh, you, of 15 to 49 of women in Nigeria being caught? Even though we've heard of Eboyi and uh, some other Igbo areas. Why does it have, yeah. Thank you so very much. Osho is no longer uh, a number one. Okay. Osho has moved uh, down. Okay. As far as prevalence of FGM is, Osho is now in number four. Right. When we go by the, you know, the, the states where we have joint program going on. So Osho has moved from number one to number four. So which one is number one then? Which the state, state is number one? The state that is number one now is uh, Imo. Imo state. Okay. Uh, number one. Okay. Followed by Kipu state. Okay, that's fine. That's fine, Mrs. Um, uh, yeah, Obelawo. Which so, country is number one in the whole of Africa? Does anybody know? For the high rate of uh, FGM incidents, nobody? Okay, I'll take the next question here. Um, and I think Nila might be able to answer this question for us. What's the position as law if it's the girl's decision to have it done? She travels abroad to get it done and shares that experience with her friends on her return back to the UK. I think because in the UK we have laws, you've got to remember FGM is illegal in the United Kingdom. And we've got laws to protect that individual. And touching upon some of the points that Layla's made, we've got to be mindful that sometimes individuals might not understand that what's been done to them is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think where things are a criminal offence, and that girl comes home and tells her friend, uh, if she ends up telling her teacher, then yes, it's an offence. Right. So what if she's over 18 then? Uh, the law in the United Kingdom uh, applies both to women and girls. So uh, it applies to a woman or a girl. So if she comes back to the UK and she's mm -hmm. over the age of 18, then the safeguarding aspects may not come into play. Okay. And then it's up to her whether if she wants to then proceed with a prosecution if it's reported to the police. Right. Okay, I have briefly, I think somebody is here. She's actually uh, representing uh, the US here. Um, I don't know whether she might be able to uh, share with us briefly um, under one and a half minutes because we need to round up by seven. I know this is a very, very crucial topic, but I do recognize the fact that a lot of people also are zooming in and zooming out of meetings. So uh, the person we have here is Neymar Dido. If Neymar Dido is there, do you want to share quickly uh, with us what the US is doing about FGM? Neymar Dido? Yes, you're on. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, excellent. In the United States. Now, uh, here in, uh, in the U.S., actually, we have the U.S. Uh, NFGM network right. that uh, has worked to really gather um, all the um, 
activists and organizations working uh, on this topic and really uh, keeping us uh, on the same page right. as far as accessing resources, training, uh, and just being aware of what we're all doing. Um, but I think one of the things that we're lacking in is uh, really diving in and talking about this topic in the way Leila talked about it today, because I feel like all of us got have gotten so used to speaking to the wrong audience, right. where especially for those of us in the West, we speak to our funders, we speak to the executives of the organizations that you know we work for or we work with, right. and we forget sometimes that we got into this for a particular population. Right. And our language uh, in the way we speak often is offensive to the very people that we're trying to affect, the very people that we want to hear us. Mm -hmm. So, and your question that you raised about terminology, for now, me personally- the question, is it illegal it, in the US? Given the fact oh, that different states have their own laws, uh, it, it is federally illegal, but um, there's loopholes within each state, uh, which we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, like, for instance, like what just happened in Minnesota, the case that got thrown out, uh, you know, uh, was children from Minnesota taken into Michigan. So because it's between two states, right. it then moved yeah. into commerce because there's money exchanged in the process. Mm -hmm. So this is something we did not even think about it. It's like you you know, violated a girl, that, that's end of story. No, they had to dig in deeper, but also the folks that we were dealing with had backing, they had support. Right. Um, and I believe like the, their lawyer was like a, one of the uh, OJ Simpson lawyers. So we're up against everything. And in fact, um, it negatively affected our work here because now the community members are telling us, look, even the government understands Right. that you know we could do this in the way that we want to do it so it backfired on us so and within the u.s the political climate here for us especially people of color immigrants mm -hmm. africans and women the war on our bodies outside of me as a survivor right there's a war on my body now mm -hmm. add the fact that i'm a survivor on top of that and i'm an anomaly in my own environment right so but it's an uphill battle. Um, so the fact that the state government and the federal government don't really go together mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, battle for us right now. So we have something like, I think, uh, 30 something states left to work on to yeah. even get that, the topic on the table to be discussed. So we have a long way to go. All right. Thank you so much for your contribution. I, I, I think I'll go back to you again for the third time, uh, Dr. Oboko. Uh, because we need to round up now. Dr. Oboko, could you just tell me, is there any statistics at all for FGM incidents? Yes, there is. Uh, um, like uh, the statistics shows that 20% uh, of all women in Nigeria have been caught by the year 2018. Right. So that's the statistics that we have. All right. So is there a safe haven or support for these yes, FGM over. survivors? Do you have, you know, is there some sort of safe uh, haven yes. for these survivors? Yes. Um, yes, we're beginning to organize something like that now. Um, we believe that um, female genital mutilation is uh, it also can be regarded as uh, um, a gender-based violence. Right. And so, so um, the shelf uh, who have been sexually assaulted, uh, we have a few. Um, some ex have existed even prior to uh, the we are doing now is to um, use the same shelter for gender-based violence for those who have, um, you know, suffered female genital mutilation. So yes, uh, we are using those shelters, and those the shelters are owned by the Federal Ministry of Women Affairs. Okay, Th thank you very much for that. I'll just take a last question here. Uh, Costly Adjari Bibe, what's your question? Costly Adjari Bibe. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm 
because they are doing the good from Oshosi in Nigeria. And mine is not um, more Western. Wow. We cannot hear you. Well, on this occasion, I will try, I mean, I'm going to just bring the meeting to a close. I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Yes. Just coming I, alone I, to I, listen. I'm just just coming alone to listen as um, a bonus to everybody here. We have to keep the conversation going. Um, I'd like to thank most especially the survivors, Alimatu. I'd like to thank Mama Sela. Uh, Hawa, unfortunately, we just couldn't get Hawa to uh, share a personal experience. Well, she's shared it with me, and it's no different from what we've heard from uh, every other person. I'd like to thank Nima uh, from the U.S., Alice Fuchs from UN Women. Thank you very much. Don't talk uh, comfort Momo. Thank you so much. Neelam, thank you. Tony Adenaike, thank you very much. Joy Clark. A whole lot of people, Dr. Uh, Uboko, we thank you. Uh, we need to still keep on talking. Ministry of Health has a lot to do because there's so many of these NGOs sprouting all over the place. Is there any collaboration of all these NGOs? We need to find out. I'd like to say a massive thank you to the young gentlemen who are the anti FGM campaigners. Thank you very much, uh, Ireti Adeshida and uh, Raymond Okwani. I do thank you for that. We need to be inclusive in all of this. Uh, it's not just uh, focused on women. Um, I'd like to thank my co-host, of course, uh, for hampering this. I'd like to thank every other person who has actually participated, Mrs. Obelawa. We need to take the uh, conversation forward to all the state governors, not only just in Oshu State. It is uh, fantastic to uh, host this uh, discussion today. Uh, for every, anybody else that I have not mentioned your name, please pardon me. I thank you all for coming. Have a good evening.